We've seen catching and throwing in the context that you're most likely to use it in practice. So in, I mean, the vast majority of cases, when you throw something or catch something, it's going to be some kind of exception object. Uh, it might be one of our standard exceptions, like runtime error or invalid argument, or it might be some exception that you make up yourself. And we'll talk about that in a different video. Um, but usually we use the, the throw and catch semantics as a way of handling error cases. And that's why I introduced them that way, as a way of a function getting out of an impossible situation. Um, it's important, I think, to know a little bit about conceptually what's actually happening, uh, and I'm going to try and unpack that in a few different ways. Now, what I'm going to do in this video is something that pretty much we, I mean, especially in this first example, we, this is a toy, basically, what I'm demonstrating. It's mostly to demonstrate that the throw and catch semantics don't have any preconceptions about what you're using them for. You can use them for anything. Although, generally speaking, it's considered a little bit weird, probably not a good practice, to use them gratuitously. So there are uses for throw and catch that aren't specifically error handling. Um, it's hard to justify that right now, but one example would be you can use throw and catch as a way of immediately returning from many, many layers of function calls without doing it the normal way, of sort of taking a shortcut. There are reasons why that is a good practice in some cases, although it's hard to think of a reason I might want to do that in this course, at least not for a few more weeks. Generally, though, besides a use like that, or actual error, handling, using throw and catch for things just for the sake of doing so is considered a bit odd. And there are reasons why it's a bad idea beyond simply not being good practice, which is that compilers are generally designed to assume that you're not using throw and catch unless you have to. And therefore, as far as throw versus return, a compiler is likely to generate code that's faster if you use the normal flow of control. That's one more reason to not go out of your way to be iconoclastic, to not go out of your way to use throw for everything when you could just write functions that return values. Now, that said, let's talk about what we can throw and how we throw it and what we can catch. So here I have some code that does obviously almost nothing, um, and I'll try running it. And there it is. So it, it, it defines a variable y, it sets y to be the result of calling a function, and then it prints it out. So the first question is, what can I throw? And uh, I'm going to create variables for this to make it more obvious what I'm doing here. So we'll create a variable called a and set that to be the value 187. I was almost going to set it to 100. That wouldn't have been any fun. Um, I'll create a string for the sake of having more than one type, and I'll set that to be the string hello now. Doesn't feel right. We'll set that to be the string. What other strings do I know? There we go. Um, so I have two values. The reason I'm making variables for these is to make it very, very obvious what their types are. Um, okay, so let's see if we can make f throw some weird stuff. So I'm going to say something like, if you give me a negative value of x, so if x is less than 0, so x is the argument that was passed in, I'm going to throw a. And I'm allowed to do that. I'm allowed to throw anything I want. Is a a value with a type? Well, yes, every value has a type in C++. The type of a is int, so I'm allowed to throw it. Um, OK, how about this? If x is greater than 10, then throw s. So I'm going to throw a string. And you'll notice string and int have almost nothing in common. And I'm allowed to throw whatever I want. I can have a function that throws multiple different things if I want to. Let's just add one more here, um, float f 1.16. OK, so floats and ints have a couple of similarities. We're going to see that those similarities are irrelevant for this context. Um, let's put up here, if x is equal to 0, then I want to throw f. So here's a function that may return an actual value. It'll always be the value 6. Or it might throw something. So I want to begin by just seeing what happens if I do that. So at the moment, I'm passing in 5. And I believe 5 will not result in an exception being thrown. And it doesn't. Um, I'm going to see if I can make this. Uh, well, you can take my word for it that I'm using 5. OK, so what if I try passing in negative 1? And we know already what happens, sort of generally what to expect if an exception gets thrown and nobody catches it. And we can see terminate was called after throwing an instance of int. So we're allowed to throw any type we want. There's nothing really that special about those standard exception objects. We can throw whatever we want. I can throw an int. I can throw a float. Let's verify that we can also throw a. So we tried int. Let's see if we can make it throw the float. This time it threw an instance of float. And then finally, what if we pass in the value uh, 100, which will result in this throw statement running. And that means that um, we'll be throwing a string. And we can see here, terminate called after throwing an instance of ugh, 
So this is the um, uh, full name of a string, uh, I'm afraid. I'm so sorry you had to see that. Uh, I'm actually have half a mind to put a black bar over it for upload. But uh, okay, so uh, this is actually an interesting point, which is that we use the friendly name std string. We're on a first name basis with this type. It turns out that the standard library is full of um, hideous abominations like this, and this is one of them. It turns out string actually has a long name, which describes everything about it, in a sense. I don't really have a good analogy here, other than if you've ever read any work of Rus Russian literature, you you're familiar with the idea that all the characters refer to each other by a simple name, but each character's actual name is very long and complicated, and you have to keep track of what everybody's called. So think of it like that. Um, think of it like reading Dostoevsky, I guess. That's the best I can do. Um, so it turns out, though, that what it's saying is we threw an instance of string. Just, just try your best not to look directly at this. So I was able to um, throw whatever I wanted. Let's actually clear this so we never have to look at it again. And what I want to talk about now is how we catch those things. So I'm going to use a try block for this. I'm actually going to put a try block just around this assignment statement. So I'm going to try and print out the value of y no matter what happens, even if the function fails. We know that if the function succeeds, the value of y is going to be 6 on line 32. What happens if it doesn't? So I'm going to put this assignment statement on line 33 uh, in a try block. And I'm actually also going to add um, this statement here, end of try. Because I want to explicitly indicate, I, I want it to be obvious when we actually get to, to the end of the try block, when, when it's not interrupted by something. OK, what can we catch? I'm going to catch int i. And you'll notice this time, I'm not catching it by reference. It turns out you don't have to use an ampersand when you catch something. The reason we use ampersand's uh, references to catch runtime error or out of range or invalid argument is more to do with the types of those specific things. We'll see later in the course, there's a specific um, uh, way those types are constructed, a way that those types have been implemented that requires us to use references there if we know what we're doing. I'm afraid I can't give much more detail than that right now. That's one of those deep dark secrets we have to wait to find out about for a few more weeks. We have to be held in suspense. Um, okay, let's see what happens if we catch a string. I'm going to call this, I'm going to deliberately call this something different. I, I actually, maybe I should call this int um, z. I want to go out of my way to not use the same name because I want it to be obvious that I'm just catching an int value. Who cares what it was originally called? Um, OK, so if, we if in our try block an int gets thrown, I'll catch it and I'll say caught an int. And then I'll print it out. All this time, I've been giving my, uh, when I catch something in a catch block, I've been giving it a name. Traditionally, I give it a name E for exception. Uh, when I give it a name, that allows me to use it. And inside the catch block, this variable z is an int, and it's been defined, and I can use it like any other int. And it is the thing that was caught. Uh, OK, so then down here on line number uh, 38, I'm gonna, I've am gonna i caught this string, so I'll say that. I'll say caught a string, and then I'll print that out, the string. There we go. Uh, and I'm going to leave that for now. So we, we haven't yet handled the case where it throws a float. Uh, but we'll just leave that. Um, OK, so in this case, I pass in the number 100 into f. When f gets the number 100, OK, not less than 0, not equal to 0, but it is greater than 10. So it throws a string. It throws the string raspberry. And we can see down here in main, it caught the string raspberry. So not only did the function throw something, but I was able to catch that same thing and then use it. Although I used it in a pretty trivial way, I was able to use it. Notice also on line 41, the value of y is 10,000. You might notice that is the initial value up here. So that means that on line 33, nothing got assigned to y. And that shouldn't surprise us because line 33 never finished. Remember, the first law of assignment statements says that when I'm working on an assignment statement, I ignore the left-hand side and I work on the right-hand side. So I call f. But f threw an exception, which means the right-hand side of the assignment statement never finished. So during the execution of the right-hand side of this assignment statement, an exception was thrown, or a thing was thrown. It was this string, and so I jumped into the catch block. I abandoned the assignment statement halfway through, and then I caught the string, and then the catch block ended. And of course, once you're in the catch block, there's no going back. So the catch block ends, I end up down on line 41. And so y still has whatever value it had before. I, was, I covered up the left-hand side of the assignment, and I never got back to it. I never actually did that assignment statement. I just gave up on the try block. I bailed out as soon as something was thrown. Um, OK, same. I'm going to try the same thing with the int. So if I pass in a value that's less than 0 to f, I will throw an int. So I'll pass in the value negative 1. And it 
caught an int and y is still 10,000 because again, we never finished the assignment statement. Now uh, for a point of context, let's try passing in the value five and recall that if I pass in the int five, the function does complete successfully. It does return a value. Um, so I'll try that. And we can see here that uh, first, we print out end of try, which means we did get to the end of our try block, and that the value of y is 6, 6 being the return value of the function f. So this assignment executed successfully, as we would have expected it to, and uh, we got to the end of the try block, and of course that means we skip over all the catch blocks and we go down to line 41. Uh, okay, one more point. What about that float that we could throw? So if I pass in the value 0, something gets thrown that I'm not able to catch, so we'll try that. And we can see here that the program gives up. So uh, although we have a catch block for int, and it's true that we could assign a float to an int if we use an assignment statement, the logic used for catch blocks is not the logic for assignment statements. So unless you have a type that matches exactly or doesn't require a coercion, and I've had to use very careful legalese there because of a reason we'll see later in this course, um, unless the catch block actually has a type that works directly, I won't be able to use it. So although I can assign a float to an int, I can coerce a float, make a conversion, I'm not allowed to treat a float directly as an int, and therefore this catch block is not suitable to catch a float. This catch block is also not suitable to catch a float because it's obviously a string and you can't convert a float to a string. Um, you can obviously call a function that does that, but you can't just assign a float to a string uh, or coerce it or anything else. Um, so what do I do here? Well, I mean, obviously what I could do is catch a float. I want to demonstrate one last feature, which is what if you call a function that could throw all sorts of weird stuff and you don't care, you just want to catch whatever it throws. Well, I have this option, a, I guess you could say it's a catch-all, um, and this is a pretty bad idea to use. Um, uh, in C++ supports it, and many languages that, that support exceptions have such a thing, but most, many languages in this situation do discourage this, the use of this feature. Now C++ doesn't, because C++ doesn't discourage anything. The whole point of C++ is to hand you every tool you could ever possibly need, and very non-judgmentally say, go nuts, figure out whatever you, you, you want to do and do it, right? Just be yourself. Um, the thing is, C++ is not discouraging you, but I am. Although C++ Plus is very tolerant and non-judgmental. I do reserve the right to judge you for certain things, and this is going to be one of them. Um, in general, what this is saying is catch uh, anything. If it isn't caught by any of these other catch blocks, catch it here. So no matter what was thrown, this will catch it. So I, I caught uh, something. And you'll observe that when I use this syntax, dot, 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 I don't give it a name because I can't. I don't know what it is. I'm catching something, something of no particular type. Because it has no particular type, I can't give it a name because every variable has to have a type. So if I gave it a name, it would need a type, and I don't know its type. And you can see there's sort of circular logic there. So instead, I'm allowed to catch whatever, but if I do that, I'm not allowed to use the thing that I caught. All I can do is acknowledge that something was caught, and I'm not allowed to learn anything more about it. So I see, I, when I write catch dot dot dot, that is a catch-all. That catches literally anything. And we can see here, in the case where I pass in zero, which results in a float being thrown, we get that float, we try and catch it here, doesn't work. We try and catch it here, doesn't work. And we get down here, and this catches literally anything. Anything that wasn't caught already will get caught on line 49. Um, as a point of context, let's go back to the case where we throw a string. And here it, it is still able to catch a string. So a string gets thrown on line 33. We try catching it here. Nope. We try catching it here. Oh yeah, this is a string. We can catch it. So we do. We only get into the catch-all if the other catch blocks don't work. Okay, so why do I discourage this? The issue is you don't know what exceptions could be thrown inside of a function. And as I said in a previous video, the only time you should really try to handle an error is if you can. You shouldn't try and be a hero. There's no sense in trying to handle every possible thing that can come up. There are some emergencies that you are not qualified to deal with. There are certain things, for example, that I can handle, and there are certain things that I can't. There are certain times when even I, an expert, I guess, have to admit that it's not my problem and I can't handle it. So for example, if I get a compile error, then I can fix it. If you show up in my office hours and ask for help on your assignment, then I can help with that. If the fire alarm goes off, then I am going to get the hell out of the building. 
building. That's not my problem. And so I don't want to try and handle every error that occurs in life. There are certain things, as I said, natural disasters, fires, floods, and earthquakes that I am not qualified to handle as far as I know. I'm so sorry. And by the same logic, if the building catches fire and you're not a firefighter, why not just head out to the parking lot and sit and wait for the, the real experts to show up? If you put this catch-all, you are saying that you will handle literally anything that could happen. Literally anything. Not just the function throwing a float, but literally anything happening. What if there's a strange memory error that occurs in the middle of the function that throws an exception? Do you really know what that is? Do you really know how to handle that? Because if you don't, you shouldn't be trying to. You should leave it to somebody else. Um, it's also true that maybe something gets thrown that you weren't expecting ever to be thrown. Something that if it gets thrown, maybe you need to fix your code. Catching literally everything will cover that up. It will disguise it. So using this catch-all is um, probably not a good idea in almost any case. It is valid, though, and you, you might see it on an exam, um, and that's the C++ way of life, which is you're allowed to, you have all these tools, you can use them, but you use them at your own risk. Just because you um, have this catch-all doesn't necessarily mean that you're qualified to handle all of the errors that can arise. So be very careful about this. In general, when in doubt, do not write a catch-all block. Only catch exceptions that you know of uh, specifically that you can handle yourself. Uh, all right, so that, I guess, is a tour of all the different things that we can throw and that we can catch. Um, the next question, I guess, is, well, we've seen already all these cases of throwing exceptions um, from a function and catching them in main. We've seen cases where we uh, throw a, 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 an exception gets thrown out of a standard library function, and then we catch it in main or we catch it in some other function that we're writing. What about a case where an exception gets thrown in one function and then doesn't get caught immediately? What about the case where it sails back uh, for a ways before getting caught. That is what I'm going to talk about uh, in the next video.